and welcome to our Saturday night speaker meeting. I'm Daphne, I'm a grateful alcoholic coming to you all from outside of Houston, Texas. Throughout the week, you will see either myself or Brad chairing these meetings. We have these meetings every single night uh, to support our fellowship and our daily maintenance and our spiritual condition. Uh, this is an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. We are glad that you are all here, especially the newcomers, in keeping with our singleness of purpose and our third tradition, which states that the only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. We ask all who participate to confine their discussions to their problems with alcohol. Uh, if you have worked the 12 steps and have at least six months sobriety and are willing and able to sponsor, would you please drop it in the chat? And if you are searching for a sponsor, drop that in the chat as well so that we can uh, try to hook you up with others. So uh, could we please have a moment of silence for the alcoholic who hasn't gotten into these rooms and for those that are in these meetings that are still suffering, followed by the serenity prayer for those who wish to join us. God, Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. The AA preamble, Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other, that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution, does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. And Ron is going to read the promises. Thank you so much, Ron. We appreciate you doing this for us almost every night of the week. Okay, guys, please keep your mics on mute. The speaker's message cannot be carried if the message cannot be heard. Bad, uh, Brad, I call him bad every time I say Brad. Brad and I can both mute your mics on our end, so please do not get discouraged if you get muted. It is nothing personal. Uh, on Saturdays, we have speaker night. We invite other members of AA to share their experience, strength, and hope with everyone that attends our meetings. We invite them to come in and to speak for up to 45 minutes. Once they have shared their story, or let me rephrase that. Yeah, well, yeah. Okay, once the speaker has shared their story, I'll close the meeting to be conscious of our time in case people need to hop out. <clears throat> and then you will be able to share or speak with the speaker by using the hand raise feature. So if you would like to be a speaker in one of our Saturday nights, please let Brad or I know. So with that said, I am so excited to introduce you guys to Matt. So Matt is the man of the hour. Take it away, Matt. All right, thank you, Daph. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm glad to be here. Uh, it's been about three and a half weeks now that I've been out after serving 34 and a half years in Louisiana Department of Corrections. I gotta say, it's, it's still pretty amazing to me and pretty uh, overwhelming to be out in a society that has changed so much since I left it in January of 1986. Um, I came from a really good family, a privileged family. I, I feel like my parents weren't very rich, but we were rich in relationships. We were rich in uh, activities. We were rich in the opportunities to go to private schools all my life. I have two brothers and a sister, one older brother, one younger brother, and my sister's older. Uh, they're all doing well, never been in trouble with the law. In fact, uh, my oldest brother's living in Missouri, and my brother and si my sister and younger brother are living in Slidell, Louisiana. They're both working with the family business. Uh, it's a printing business. And um, it all started for me, I guess, when I was very little. My father was a coach at playground in Metairie, Louisiana, and I always tagged along. All the teams that he was coaching, I was always there watching, and in the bleachers, under the bleachers, 
on the side of the field, in the gymnasium. I was always around the ballpark. So I wanted to be an athlete all my life. And all through my childhood, I played playground ball. I played ball in schools. And in the sixth grade, I ended up transferring to a, a well-known and renowned football high school called John Curtis Christian High School, where they have a tradition of excellence and just winning state championship after state championship year after year. So I was, I was pretty much a, a jock. I was an all-star. Uh, it started about nine years old. I was traveling internationally to Puerto Rico at nine years old, uh, playing in basketball tournaments. And that wasn't even my best sport. My best sport was playing football. And uh, once I got to, to Curtis, that was the, the main focus of the school. Even though it was a Christian school, uh, I believe that football was more important than anything else. Now the administrators, they, they really love God and they really serve God and they really did wonderful things for the kids at the school. But in my eyes, you know, football was more important than everything because that's, that's what drove everybody on campus. And I was, I was wanting to be the best in, in the whole school. I was wanting to be the best in the neighborhood. I was wanting to be the best at everything that I played. And as long as I was doing well and making good grades, uh, I received a lot of recognition and praise from family and friends. And uh, I liked it. I liked it a lot. I, I, I lived for that. I wanted to to excel in everything that I did. I wanted to be the best. So once I got up into high school, uh, I, I tried to start getting the edge and, and my pursuit of perfection, I guess you could say. And I started using uh, enhanced and like steroids and, and taking them. I was turned on to them by a friend that was in high school with me and it was pretty much a secret from everybody and didn't want anybody to know and to, just to get a little edge on everybody else I, I started to take them uh, in the summer of 1985 and I started to increase speed and, and strength and gain weight significantly in, in a matter of six months and I was doing fairly well and I, I really believed that I was going to be a starter in my freshman season and if not freshman, then definitely my sophomore year, I would be playing and, and be one of the all-stars in the high school. And my hopes were and dreams were to play college football, go to Notre Dame. You know, I'm a devout Catholic, come from a Catholic family and raised all my life in Catholic school. And then when I switched over to Curtis, you know, it's, it's not a Catholic. It was, it was a Protestant school, but uh, I still had those those principles, those morals that my parents instilled in me. So I was really looking forward to, to going to college, and making something of, my, of myself and earning the scholarship. And I think I could have done it either through academics or athletics. And, and I really felt good about that. So I was really striving to do that. And as I got better and as I got stronger and I, I got with that came more popularity. And with popularity came a lot of pressure, a lot of peer pressure from uh, all the different groups at school. There were so many different groups that wanted my uh, participation with them. And some of them tried to be real controlling. And like, look, if you're gonna be with our group, then you can't be with these other groups over there because you know we're against them. And I said, well, why is that? You know, Why can't I be friends with y'all and also friends with these other groups and uh they just didn't seem to understand that because I was always friendly you know that they, they even when I first came to prison they called me friendly Matt because I was just I didn't have any grudge against anybody I didn't hold anything against anybody no matter how they lived their life you know I, I just tried to live without judgment and uh when the popularity came in high school for, from sports, they had celebration parties at the games and I would go to it and I was, I was adamantly against any kind of drugs or alcohol, but uh, they were always seemed to make their way into the parties. And with these parties came uh, temptation. 
and a lot of a lot of pretty girls in school, and I was pretty popular. I was a whole lot cuter back when I was younger. I had a full head of hair, black curly hair, and uh, you know, it was, just took a lot of pride in my appearance, and and uh, had a lot of friends, and and I kind of gave in to some of the temptation, and I started to to drink with with some of the friends at the parties, and I. I quickly realized that alcohol was not for me because every time I drank, I would get sick. And every time I got sick, I promised God that I would never do this again if he got me through it. And he ended up getting me through it. And the next thing you know, I'd be drinking the following weekend after the football game. And uh, it would it would seem like to be a, a repetitive cycle. Um, my family was pretty social in the neighborhood and they would have parties and all and a lot of friends would come over and they would have plenty of alcohol. They would be drinking and a lot of times, you know, we would sneak a drink, go maybe get a frozen drink uh, while they weren't looking. You know, I like, I thought it was like ices and Slurpees, but they, they contained alcohol and I would get sick and they would know that I would sneak into the room and get a drink and then leave out. But I don't, I don't blame my parents for anything because they raised me right. They taught me right, and I just didn't listen. In December of 1985, my parents told me that they were going to separate. In my whole life, I believed that my family was everything to me, and I, I pretty much just uh, kind of gave up on, on life. They told me that I had to, to choose to live with one, either my father or my mother, and I I was just devastated by that. I said, there's no way that I could choose one over the other because I love both of them uh, equally and without condition. And so I pretty much started to rebel and started to do things that I was always against, like smoking weed and uh, hanging out all night. And it seemed like that I was doing these things, trying to get some attention, whether it was for the right or wrong reasons. I still tried to, to uh, do well in school. I still tried to do well in sports. And it did, just didn't seem to get near the attention that I once had because there were so many uh, problems going on around me, uh, both in school, both in, at home. And uh, I just really didn't know when to turn. I, I wasn't the type of person to go and and tell somebody, look, I'm struggling with this. I'm having a difficult time. I need some encouragement or I need some assistance. I need some advice. <clears throat> I was always pretty independent. That was pretty much the strong guy. You know, I was always the leader. <clears throat> they would always push me up in, in the forefront and say, let Matt do it because he's, he's good at everything. And, <clears throat> and I, I really didn't like getting pushed up in the front because I, I was like, the guy that always wanted to sit in the back of the room. I wanted to be the guy that helped everybody, but not the one that was always doing all the talking when everybody was around. And uh, I was very shy, even though I had a lot of friends and it was, uh, it was troubling for me. So a lot of times just being social with all my friends at parties and all, I would drink a little bit to try and <clears throat> come down. It seemed like I was, higher, stronger than everybody, and I needed uh, just a little something to bring me down to uh, a, a little bit slower level, and then I could relate with them, and when I did that, it seemed like uh, I kind of lost control of my, of my personality, because then I would, I would start uh, acting like someone else, like acting like the rest of the crowd, because I wanted to be with them, I wanted to be with them with the rest of the crowd. I wanted them to like me. And uh, I thought that was the way to go, but it wasn't. And uh, I got invited in uh, around the same time, around December, January, right after my folks gave me the news and by a friend wanted to, me to be in a Mardi Gras parade with her. It was my, she kind of was my girlfriend and wasn't at the same time. So I wanted to really impress her and, uh, I didn't have the money to pay for all the throws to be in the parade. And I thought, man, what am I going to do? Because I, I used to go hustle 
during the summertime, I can go cut grass and, and make a little money cleaning up people's yards and maybe doing some painting and cleaning houses or something. Uh, but it was wintertime, and that, that eliminated that from the possibility. Uh, and I just don't know why I decided to one night to break into a, one of my neighbor's house that I thought weren't home and ended up going through the house looking for something that I might be able to uh, use to buy some Mardi Gras beads or, or even to sell to buy some Mardi Gras beads. And, and I always believed that these people came home on me while I was in their house. And I panicked and tried to run out. I was scared to death, really was. And uh, it was the worst day of my life because uh, the man grabbed me and tackled me in his house. And I just freaked out and I ended up stabbing him several times until he fell and his wife came and, and I ended up stabbing her as well. And I ran out of the house and uh, I didn't even realize what I had done until later on. And I looked at myself and my hands were all cut up. And uh, I realized what I had done. I was like, man, my life is over now. I don't know what I can do now. Uh, and yet at the same time, I tried to live my life uh, the same way that I always have and, and tried to ignore it and block it out. But I just couldn't. Every time the phone rang, every time the door uh, doorbell rang, I would be the one to answer it. I'd be the one to go and run and see who it was. Always thinking that one, one day it was going to be somebody coming to look for me, like the police. And rightfully so, you know, for what I did, I deserved it. And uh, it was like a week later, uh, I was arrested as a juvenile, and they tried me as an adult. I pled guilty to a life sentence. And in Louisiana, a life sentence means the rest of your life. Uh, I pled guilty because they wanted to give me the, the electric chair. And uh, the way I felt when I was arrested, you know, I, I knew I was guilty. I knew I had done a terrible thing. And I realized it, it should have never happened. If I was in my right state of mind, I could have just gave up and it would have been just a, a trespassing charge or breaking and entering. <clears throat> and uh, but I wasn't thinking right. I, I panicked and I was scared and I ended up killing two innocent people. And uh, I hated myself for that. You know, I really believed that I probably should have died for what I did. And I'm just fortunate to be alive today because uh, it allowed me to plead guilty to life. And uh, ended up going to prison. I was just 16 years old. They threw me in with regular population. And uh, I didn't know anything about prison. I didn't know anything about uh, prison life. I didn't know anything about prison mentality. I didn't know anything about the, the cons and the games that they play in, in, in the prison. So here I am, cute little uh, preppy kid entering into the prison system uh, without a clue as to what my future was gonna hold. And I remember when I first entered in, I was in this, uh, it was like a, a new intake orientation uh, prison. <clears throat> and they had this old guy that was sitting right on the side of me. And I strongly believe he was a sexual predator because he kept trying to put his hand on my leg while I was, he was sitting next to me. So every time he would try to, I would scoot over until I ran out of bench. I couldn't scoot anymore. You know, I look at it back now and, it's, and it was kind of funny, but it was, I was scared to death at the time. And uh, he told me, he says, he says, you, he says, you're going to be all right if you get to prison and, uh, you know, if you stay away from drugs and you stay away from alcohol, stay away from gambling and just get your education and get involved in everything you can. And I believe that was good advice that he gave me because I, I took, I took his advice and I did all that. But at the same time, he was still trying to put his hand on my leg and, uh, I didn't want to get in trouble. It was my first day in prison, you know, thinking I'm going to, I'm going to try and keep a clean record. So maybe I got some chance if I, if I do the right things here, but at the same time, I wasn't going to let anybody take advantage of me, especially anything like that. So, uh, you know, I, I just got up and I told him, I said, man, 
I said, you're not going to do that. And I appreciate it. You just get away from me. So he did. And I arrived in prison in, in North Louisiana. It was like five miles from the Arkansas state line. And uh, it was crazy because I walked in and it seems like the whole prison just shut down. When I walked in, it was like, it was as if uh, a celebrity had walked in because everybody stopped what they were doing and just turned and looked at me. And I was so uncomfortable that I, I just wanted to cry. But in prison, you can't reveal your weaknesses. So here I am, just a little little teenage kid entering in this prison with all these hardened convicts. And uh, I was like the, the fresh catch of the day coming in uh, off the dock. And I really felt like I really wanted to end my life at that time. You know, I contemplated suicide because I just thought to myself, my God, I cannot live this way. There's no way that I can live the rest of my life in prison. And uh, to even try and comprehend that I was going to die in prison because life in prison in Louisiana meant till you die. Uh, I just, I didn't want to believe it. And I always just uh, knew that something might help happened that I, it would help me to get uh, out one day. And I just did the best that I could and went to work every day and tried to be with a good attitude. But every, it seemed like all the time I had guys coming at me uh, because I did have a little bit of money that my folks were sending me, you know, and a lot of guys there, they don't have anything and they don't have anybody. And they, they envy anybody who has something of significance and because I was getting visits, because I was getting mail, because I was using the phone, because I was able to go to the commissary and buy some snacks every once in a while. You know, I had guys trying to come and take advantage of me. And uh, I got in a few fights in the beginning when I was like 17 years old. And, and all through this time, you know, I was, I was just trying to maintain a positive outlook, but it was very difficult. It really was. I was depressed a lot. And I uh, I had a hard time forgiving myself for what I had done. You know, I felt like I deserved this. I felt like I deserved uh, to be mistreated. You know, I wasn't worthy of anything good, anything positive. And it was a struggle to maintain uh, a, a positive outlook or any kind of outlook other than just complete despair and hopelessness, which was the reality. And, uh, you know, I started, I just started to pray and I thank God that I have some praying parents because uh, it was pretty bleak at, at, at times. You know, I went to bed a lot of times with covers over my head and just crying. Uh, it was very difficult. Uh, prison is definitely not the place to find friends and make friends. Uh, they do have a lot of good people in prison that just made some bad mistakes. There's a lot of people that really do deserve to be there, and I felt like I was one of them. Uh, but I really did meet some good people. And it seems like the more that I got down on my knees and prayed, the more that do doors opened for me. My first few years in prison, you know, I, I had some friends that were involved in drugs and drinking. Well, uh, they would make their own homebrew. And they would have guys that were there that would smuggle in narcotics, uh, and pills, and whatever they could get in. You know, they would get in. And every once in a while, you know, I would give in to some of my friends and go and smoke some weed with them. And it was, uh, and every time I did it, I felt guilty. But it was, it was a way to get, get away from this uh, hopelessness that I had in, in inside side of me you know I didn't really believe that I deserved any kind of uh, mercy it took me about uh, five or six years uh, before I, I really started to have any kind of uh, spiritual awakening you know I was going to church all the time I was going to AANA every Monday 
and I went and I, I wouldn't speak. They'd have open mic all the time and I wouldn't share. And then finally, uh, I wanted to share my talk and I did. And it was as I was uh, at the mic, I was getting very emotional because I started sharing about what happened. And uh, it seems like a, 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 just a, a load fell off my shoulders as I was just admitting things that I've done, uh, people that I've hurt. And then I, I just, it became easier when I just vented with uh, these guys in AANA. And shortly after that, they asked me to, to serve on the steering committee, <clears throat> which would be the guys, you know, set up for the meetings and all. And I'm just new to this. And they already put me in leadership positions. You know, it's like the story of my life. <clears throat> and uh, just the things that I, I, I hated the most, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, that they, they wanted to do again, you know, even in AANA, I knew nothing about. I started reading the big book and I started going through steps and actually working the steps. And my first uh, time going through my step five, uh, they had it set up where they had these uh, men that would come in from off the street, <clears throat> total strangers, guys who made themselves available for the fifth step, or guys in prison. And I went and I talked to this guy and uh, I just praise God for him because I just cried the whole time. And I told him everything that I did my whole life, as embarrassing as it was, as shameful as it was, as terrible as it was, I shared with him. And he just gave me a hug and he says, you know what? He said, I've done all this, all the things that you just told me about. He said, I cried just like you when I, when I admitted uh, my fifth step to someone. He said, so I don't judge you. And uh, I just want you to know, man, that God loves you and he forgives you. And I remember that, you know, I remember that day like it was just yesterday. And for me, that was a true blessing because I just let a load off of my shoulders. And, and I discovered this at AA, you know, I was going to church all this time and I didn't have a, an awakening as, as this. And uh, just as God in his great wisdom and divine providence can do, I attended a, uh, a Kairos retreat shortly after that. And that was just uh, a mind blowing experience. You know, it was just these total strangers came in and loved on us and fed us for like three days. They gave us all you can eat meals and they shared their testimonies with us. We, we sang praise and worship songs. And uh, it was at that point there that I realized that uh, I wasn't the same person anymore, that I was a new creation. And uh, I realized that despite the circumstances that I was facing, despite the realities of this hopeless life sentence that I was serving, that I could actually have a good life in prison. And God opened doors for me to get some of the best jobs in the prison, put me in contact with a lot of the staff and administration. And uh, I just didn't know where all this was coming from. But I, I know now in hindsight that, you know, these were all blessings that were just falling up into my lap because, you know, I was, I was reading my, my devotions every day. I was praying every day. I was going to AA every week. I was going to church all the time. And I was doing it sincerely with a, with a genuine heart. And uh, the gospel today, when I went to church this morning with my parents, it was a beautiful thing. Got the whole hands with them and pray. And the gospel today was, uh, I brought it with me. It says that everyone who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my heavenly father. But whoever denies me before others, I will deny them before my heavenly father. 
and I began to, to share what God did for me to other guys. And a lot of guys go to church service for some coffee. They go to church services so they can make the Christmas party at the end of the year and get some free socks and, and shampoo. And uh, I was going because I, I really had a, a true zeal to be in the presence of God and just to, to know that I was forgiven for everything that I had done and terrible things that I'd done. And that I had hope for a future that didn't include uh, the prison setting, didn't include uh, the possibility of getting stabbed in my sleep or somebody stealing all my property, breaking into my lockers when I weren't, when I was at work or wasn't in the dorm. And uh, that was a harsh reality. Every day, you know, you had to look over your shoulder and it seems like even though I was nice as can be to everybody, you know, you still had that the risk that somebody just didn't like you just because you had and they didn't. Or you were smiling and at peace and joyful, having making good friends in, in prison and uh, they were just miserable and, and bitter. And so you had to be real careful how you talk to people and, and uh, how you treat the people because you didn't have to do anything they have bad things happen to you. So I was just thankful that uh, right when bad things were happening, I, God always gave me a door to walk through. And right before uh, I might get a job change, I might get a whole uh, quarters change or housing change to a whole other unit on the prison. And uh, right after I would leave, they would have a riot, or some kind of gang fights or something going on where people got stabbed, people got you know, jaws broken and uh, bones broken. It was just, it was a horrible experience that I just avoided. And all my friends would say, man, how did you know? I said, I didn't. I said, I was just trying to be obedient to the leading of, of what uh, I felt was the right thing to do. And uh, God opened so many doors for me. It's just, it was scary. It was it was unbelievable. Now that I look back and see people that I, I made contacts with uh, like 25 years ago came and assisted me uh, at some of my hearings and writing letters on my behalf, you know, administrators. And I was just blown away because it went into so specific details of the things that I did while I was in prison. And I didn't even realize anybody was even watching me. I didn't even realize anybody even knew what I was doing. I just did it because I, I thought that was, you know, something that was going to make my life better. And it did. And, uh, it might be hard to, to understand, but I was just sharing with my mom and dad today. Uh, they said, you know, uh, while we were drinking our coffee at, at the kitchen table, they said, did it go, did it go fast for you? You know, because they asked me, they said, it seemed like it was just yesterday, you know, you left us. And I told them, I said, you know what, Mom? I said, I lived a good life in prison. You know, as as scary and terrifying and uh, terrible as it sometimes was, I lived a really good life because... I had a lot of friends. I had a lot of guys that, uh, you know, we we lived together. These guys that had life sentences, guys that are still in prison today, that I still keep in touch with. And they may not get out because they weren't juvenile lifers. You know, they're not gonna, they may, may not be afforded parole eligibility ever. And my heart goes out to them. You know, I wish I could do something to help them. And I, I do plan on helping them if I possibly can in, in any way, because that, that could have been me. That was me at one time. You know, I was, I was destined to die in, in the prison system. And, uh, you know, I just thank God for faith. I thank God for deliverance. I thank God for AA and NA 
and working the 12 steps and having that spiritual awakening and that conscious contact of God, you know, the way that I understood him. And I just started living my life by sharing that message with other, others like I'm doing today, you know, because it was a hopeless situation. It was a situation so bad that I wanted to die in prison. I prayed for death. I prayed that something would happen to me, a sickness or anything, that I wouldn't have to stay in that prison any longer. Even though I was joyful, even though that, uh, you know, I was going to church, even though that I was living a good life, I still, I still wish that I would die because the reality was that I still had life with no opportunity for probation, parole, or any kind of release. And uh, in 2005, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that juvenile sentenced to life could no longer be executed. And I got back in court because they threatened me with the electric chair. And I pled guilty to life to avoid it. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court and they ruled that uh, because I wasn't sentenced to death, it didn't affect me. And I had gotten married in 2006 to a woman that she was standing in faith with me and believing that I was about to get out because of this new ruling. And uh, in 2010, she just walked away, said, I can't take it anymore. You know, that was when the court ruling came down. And uh, once again, I was facing the reality of life without parole uh, the rest of my life. So in 2012, seven years later, U.S. Supreme Court ruled on juvenile life without parole sentences. And they stated that anybody 17 and under who was tried as an adult should be given a reasonable opportunity for release. And that opened the door for me. In October of 2017, the parish, Louisiana has parishes, counties everywhere else, but the parish or county that I'm from decided they were going to contest me having parole eligibility. So it took two years for the judge to, to rule that I was eligible, that I wasn't incorrigible, that I wasn't irreparably corrupt. And he granted me parole eligibility in November of 2019. They set a parole date for me in June of this year on the 16th. And praise God, I went up and faced much opposition. But thank God that, that he opened the door for me to write a letter of apology to my victims in 2000. And one of the victims refused my letter. They rejected it. So I just respected that and, and realized that, you know what, I did everything that I could to try and apologize. And, and, and uh, I don't know if I could ever make up for what I did. But I wanted them to know how sincerely and genuinely sorry and, and uh, remorseful that I was for what I did to them. But what I didn't realize was they had two other uh, victims, uh, two other family members that were daughters of a male victim. And uh, they weren't listed in, in the court papers as victims. So when I was going back to try and get parole eligibility, their names popped up. You know, it was just by the grace of God that they discovered that they, they even existed. And I had a meeting with them. And I think I, for those of you who heard this the last time I spoke, you know, it was, it was mind blowing because these women, they hugged my neck, they kissed me and uh, told me they loved me and that they forgive me. And they always been praying for me all this time. And I was crying the whole time. I had snot coming up my nose like a little six-year-old boy. And she just said, you know, you don't have to worry about this ever again. You just got to worry about your life from this point forward in the free world because we're going to advocate on your behalf. 
and you've served long enough, it's time for you to get out. And if it had not been for that, I, you know, I may not be free right now. I may not be sitting right here in, in, under these trees uh, enjoying freedom uh, because I had a lot of opposition, the district attorney and uh, the arresting officer who later became the chief of police contested me harshly, said that I was the uh, most vicious man they ever met. And the whole time I was in their courtroom, most of the time I was crying like a little baby. And, uh, you know, don't get me wrong, I deserved the sentence that I got. I truly believe that because I did a terrible thing. You know, I took two people's lives and, it, and, it, and I hated that day. I hated myself for doing that. Uh, like I said, it was the worst day of my life. And uh, I just thank God that he's able to forgive me. I believe that my family, my friends have forgiven me. And I also believe that uh, these two ladies have truly forgiven me. And uh, one of them even told me, you know, we consider you to be uh, a extensive part of our family now. And I was like, how is that even possible? They consider me to be a part of their extended family. And, uh, you know, they're, they're definitely heaven sent. And I know that uh, I don't deserve this, this mercy, this grace that they've extended, but I'm so happy for it. I'm so thankful for it. And, uh, you know, I correspond with them all the time. You know, I send them pictures. I send them text messages. I talk to them on the phone. And it's, it's, it's really beautiful that this type of a relationship was even open and available to me personally. Uh, you know, God has really changed my life. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a person to go around preaching, but I know what God has done for me in my life because I just surrendered to it. No, I wasn't afraid to get down on my knees and say, God, I need you. I need you more than anything. I'm alone, and I don't have any way out of this except through you. And, uh, you know, I got to the point now where it's just like he's become so real in my life. He's blessed me so much that I don't need a drink anymore. You know, I've been around friends since I've gotten out. They're like, you want a beer? You know, you're free now. You can drink beer. You know, like, I don't want a beer. I've even had something like, you want to go smoke a joint? And I'm like, heck no. You know, things like that is what landed me in, in doing a stupid crime, landed me in prison the rest of my life. Why would I want to go back to that anymore? Because I'm free. You know, I can go to the Dollar Tree. I can buy a whole basket full of stuff for a little bit of money. You know, there's just great things in there. <laughs> it's like, this is an amazing store. I love it. Uh I went to Super Walmart. It took me like five days to see the whole thing because you got to realize I don't have any transportation right now. So I'm at the mercy of these guys working for the parole project that provide transportation back and forth. So they dropped me off and they're like, all right, we're going to wait in the, in the parking lot. Go get what you need. And, you know, but hurry up. So I got to run in Walmart and don't know where anything's at. Luckily, they got a bunch of people sitting around that, that work there. I could say, hey, where's this? And I go run and grab it and come on back out. But there's no cash or shears in the doggone store. And I don't know how to check out. Because everybody's scanning their cards. I don't even have a card yet. You know, I'm working on getting my bank account open. I'm working on getting a debit card. <laughs> there's nobody there to pay cash to. Uh, it's blowing me away, you know. Uh, it, it's really beautiful. I haven't figured out this cell phone yet. I'm still trying I'm having fun with it, and it's it's so much fun that I just like to sit and play on it. But I used to tease people about it because every time you see them, you know they're on their phone and they just got blocking out everything in in the in the world, sitting on that phone playing games and texting and doing all this. And I see why, you know, because I am intrigued by it and I want to I want to learn more. But at the same time, you know, I want to spend time with people that who have stuck with me all this time and the people that have uh, prayed for me, people that have come in to the prison as volunteers, like Robert, that uh, showed us nothing but love and uh, just embraced us, sat there with us and listened to us, cried with us. Uh, you know, there's really some amazing volunteers that come into the prison. Rob's one of them, and I love him to death. 
you know, I, I, uh, I wish I could hug him every day, you know, because he's he was a true blessing. And I wouldn't be in this meeting tonight, you know, if it wasn't him inviting me to it. So uh, I thank God for him. But there's so many other people as well, just like Rob, that that helped me. People that I want to reach out with, people I want to go fishing with, people I want to go swimming with, people I want to go have lunch with. I was able to do that this week with two two old friends, you know, we went and ate. And, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't pick the place, but we went to Hooters, you know. Probably not my ideal place for lunch, but it was very good. I was surprised the chicken was that good. I thought the chicken was terrible. It was just guys went there to see the girls. And I felt like a old, dirty old man sometimes, you know, because all these young girls are sitting in there with these little short shorts on and, and look like they had the little sister's T-shirt on. And uh, I wanted to say, girl, you know what? You too doggone pretty to be doing this. You know, there's something else that you could do. And uh, I, I just felt bad for them, even though they're probably making good money. Uh, but, you know, that was just one experience. You know, I got to go sit with an old friend and we sit and chat chat and, then I had my first espresso uh, at CC's. It was like a, I forget what it was, a turtle misachino or something like that. And it was, as soon as I drank it, I, my eyeballs opened up, you know, like I was wired up. It was, it was delicious. I want more. And I'm not trying to be addictive, you know, I want addictive behavior. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's beautiful things like this that are happening in my life. You know, and right now I'm, I'm on the hunt for jobs. I don't know what I'll be doing, but I have plenty of options right now. And uh, I just want to have a good job. I don't even care if I make a lot of money. I just want to be able to, to be involved with my church, be involved with my family, to be involved in AA and NA. And uh, I plan on facilitating Celebrate Recovery. I plan on facilitating catechism at the church uh, because that's what I was doing while I was in prison. It's not something that I, I'm just starting to do. I was, I've been doing it for years and years. And that's, I think that is what made me the man that I am today. You know, things that got me blessed by my heavenly father, you know, for serving him and just for trying to live a righteous life. And uh, it's truly amazing. And I just want to shout out to everybody that's listening tonight, you know, that, there is hope. You know, if you do seek him, and I'm, when I say him, I mean our Heavenly Father, our God himself. If you seek him, you know, he will become real in your life because he did it. You know, it's, it's just, I can only credit him for all this that's going on in my life. It's a true blessing. I'm living in an apartment rent-free. Uh, they gave me a bunch of clothes when I got out. One of them was a polo shirt. You know, it's like, man, I would never spend $80 on a shirt. This is an $8 shirt they gave me. And uh, I got $800 in my, in my savings account that I earned while I was working in prison. You know how long it takes to save up $800 when you make 20 cents an hour? You know, I made 20 cents an hour for 35 years. <laughs> and... Uh, it took me a long time, but I'll use that money to pay for college education. Well, I was there, you know, paid in $30 installments. And, uh, you know, it was just, a, a, seems like some, something that you could just read about in a storybook or, or something that's fictional. But, you know, it's, it's, prison was actually a blessing for me. Really, uh, it was really good for me. And I'm so fortunate to, Still have my parents alive today. They love me, and I have friends that uh, that really just going out of the way to help me and assist me. And I just contribute this all to the grace of God, you know, just His blessings and His love. And uh, I know if He did it for me, who you know broke every commandment in in, in the Bible, and I know He'll do it for anybody else. You know, I just encourage you to. You know, keep coming back because it works if you work it. You know, it was one of our old sayings, and and uh, it's true. 
You know, the more you work it, the more you make friends, the more you start serving other people and taking your mind off of yours. And that's when doors just open and blessings come. And it's really beautiful. And I just I thank y'all for, for listening to me tonight. And I, I just uh, I praise God for my life. Praise God for going to prison. Praise God for uh, freeing me, you know, and releasing me from, from prison. And I'm able to share this with you guys and my family. It's a beautiful thing. It really is. You know, I'm not ashamed of crying. Uh, I'm just not ashamed of anything. You know, I got a new phone. I had, got my mom's old phone. It had, like, flowers, and it was pink. And mom's like, we got to get you a new case. And I'm like, I don't care. I love that pink case. You know, it's got flowers on it. So what? You know, I don't care what people think. Uh, you know, I'm just glad to, to enjoy life for what it is. You know, with what I have or what I don't have, still, still wonderful. It could be that way for everybody. You know, and I just I thank you all for letting me be here. So that's all I have to say tonight. You know, you know, just praise God. That's all I can say. <clears throat> wow, that's all I can say at this moment is wow. Thank you so much, Matt, for uh, for being here and sharing your experience, strength, and hope. I knew it was going to be a great, a great <laughs> share. And you, you did not let me down or anybody else, I think, for that matter. Um, you know, something that would make most people bitter made you better. And you are just, I, 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 I got a, a lump in my throat. I can hardly swallow. Um, I, I can promise you the next trip I make to Alabama, I'm coming through Baton Rouge and I'm going to meet with you and Robert and we're going to have coffee and we're not going to have it at CeCe's. We're going to go like Starbucks and I'm going <laughs> to take your ass to the Dollar Tree <laughs> and, and to my favorite stores and take you and get you some stuff for your apartment. So I guess I need to put it on my list that I need to come to Alabama very soon and I'm going to... Stop talking. I will text you later and because uh, I'd really like to talk to you some more later tonight or maybe tomorrow. I'm sorry. Sure. And um, I'm going to go ahead. I'm just going to close out with the Lord's Prayer to be conscious of our time. And then we will let everybody talk to Matt and share uh, whatever you guys questions or whatever you have with him. Uh, and so you can use the hand raise feature and I will call on you in order of the hands. So, um, and also real quickly, if anybody has, um, any topics that you, I'm going to try to get these, uh, our next three weeks, uh, chiseled down. It's just one less step that I have to do through the week. Uh, cause yeah, like I'm so busy. And, um, so if you have any topics that you would like for us, to, uh, have throughout the week, please text them. I think everybody should have my number. If not, uh, drop it in the chat or get us on Instagram, let brighter I know, because we really want to do meetings on what you guys want to hear. So uh, I'll go ahead and close us out in prayer. And then if you need to drop off, drop off, but just start raising your hand and we'll start calling on you guys. And thank you again, Matt, for being here. Um, my, my pleasure. Brother, God bless you. All right, guys, feel free to uh, share this meeting with others so that we can continue to carry this message. Um, who keeps us sober and gives us hope? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right. Let's see here.